Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County, and happy Aloha Friday. I've got my green Aloha shirt. This is a high quality made of genuine rayon, not the cheap stuff. So uh, whenever I meet we here, I always have the good shirts on, and I'm never the cheap shirts. And uh, so it's Aloha Friday, so I do wear my Hawaiian shirt during the day. And also, if uh, those of you like a little uh, uh, drink every once in a while, it is National Anazette Day. So if you enjoy Anazette, it's got a little bit of a licorice flavor, uh, maybe in your espresso um, or uh, just straight up, you can celebrate today having uh, National Anazette Day. So thank you for joining us today at PSG of Mercer County, a professional service group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody in any type of career transition. Doesn't matter why you're in a career transition, uh, we are here to provide uh, education opportunities, presentations, and other resources to help you become more efficient and more effective in your own job search. And among the tools that we have, and we talk about this each week, but for anybody who's visiting us today for the first time, we do have our LinkedIn group. It is called PSG of Mercer County. We have over 1,670 members, 1,670. They are all people that have attended one of our meetings, either in person or virtually. And that's uh, the only requirement of joining our LinkedIn group. So when you search for the group, PSG of Mercer County in LinkedIn, uh, and press the join button, you'll be put in pending status. And about once a week, we go through and see the people that have requested and do, do make sure that they have attended at least one meeting. So we do take attendance. Uh, uh, the go to meeting does let us know who has come to the meeting, it's just part of the information it provides. And so we check that or we check our historical roles and uh, email lists and uh, validate that way. And if for some reason I don't have your email address, what we will do is um, we'll send you an in mail in LinkedIn and just ask you to confirm so that we have that information and then we can let you into our group. But our real goal is we're trying to keep the group only for serious job seekers and people that are serious about helping job seekers. And we're looking to just kind of keep out list collectors, name collectors, people that are in it for themselves or for their own agenda outside of helping job seekers. And once you're a member of a group, um, you know, post discussions, you know, you can share an article, job leads, any kind of information. You may even want to post your elevator pitch to introduce yourselves to the other 1,670 members. So, uh, and also it is a big help because uh, to you in your job search, no matter how many first degree connections you have, you can in-mail any of our group members, even if they are not yet a first degree connection. You have extended your connections virtually by up to 1,670 people. And we do have our website. It is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. It's over 120 pages of content, so it is more than web pages. We also have downloadable documents like sample marketing plans, sample resume, sample cover letter, the standard and the T letter format. So and they're all in Word format, not PDF. So you can download them and edit them and use them for your own self if you need. So you may want to take a look at our website. We did try our very best to make it a great resource for anybody who is in a career transition. So this is almost a moment when I would turn the meeting over to the presenter, but since I'm the presenter and I've already got the the screen here, no need to turn it over to me, but uh, we'll remind you just a little bit of ground rules. Please do keep your microphones on mute uh, during the presentation. It's just to make sure that we don't have any accidental interruptions from background noise, uh, just to pre prevent interruptions. And if we have any background noise, uh, we may just pause the presentation so we can be sure to mute everybody. Uh, or that person who may have left their microphone on. And the nice thing is uh, once I get the video downloaded a little later, I'll be able to edit out the interruption if it was significant enough to do so. And uh, we will be uh, having interactive questions and answers. Uh, Bill Pagula will be monitoring chat. We use chat to kind of get our attention for questions. And so you can use it one of two ways. One is you can type the word question. And I see Don actually put a note in chat for how to do that. You can just type the word question, and that's the digital equivalent of raising your hand. And uh, Bill will look for that, and uh, he'll find, uh, I guess, listening to my presentation, a nice point in which he can just quickly interrupt me, let me know there's a question. If you type the word question, then uh, Bill will just ask you, turn on your mic and ask your question. 
<coughs> Excuse me. The other option, if you prefer, type the word question and then type your question. And that's an option if you don't want to be on the microphone. And Bill will read the question out loud. And again, we will do our very best to answer the question uh, as close to the moment that you um, uh, raise your hand or ask us the question. So those are the ways we'll use the question. Either type the word question and you'll be called on, or type the word question followed by your question, in which case Bill will read it out loud and we will get your questions answered. Also, when the presentation is over a little later, we'll have time for Q&A, of course, at the end of the presentation. But when it's over a little later, we'll keep the microphones on and the session open for a while. We will have turned off the recording by then. So it's like just hanging around the meeting room for a little while. Uh, it usually lasts a half hour, 40 minutes or so, depending on what the activity and discussion is. And we talk about anything we want, not much different than if we were hanging around the meeting room. So feel free to hang around. And uh, I, of course, will be hanging around. So uh, be like, nice to participate and chat with people if you want. Okay. And it's at this point that I would be introducing the presenter. Since I am the presenter, that just seems a little self-serving and I will not do that. Uh, hello, it's me. That's my introduction. But let me quickly share my screen. Just give me a moment to do so. Let's close this up and get ourselves started. And there, it looks like I am sharing the screen and I'm gonna minimize the view of seeing people and chat. So right now I do not see chat, I do not see people. But uh, this is a topic that I thought would be uh, helpful and important. Um, and it's talking about promoting your brand, promoting your value, but it's the importance of personal branding for negotiation. A lot of people have had questions they've asked me, and I know they've asked other people, how do we negotiate our salary or any other compensation? And so we're going to talk a little bit about techniques for negotiation, but the value of your personal brand and your value in that negotiating process. And so what gets you there? There we go. So let's first talk about what is your personal brand. And really very simple, your, your brand is kind of the image that people see of you. It's not what you think of you, because sometimes it's a little hard for us to be completely objective, but your brand is what people see of you. It's how they see you, not how you see you. And it's a combination of different things, and you can, you can kind of figure this out when you're talking to people, um, how they look at you, how they react to you in real life. You know, do they have very positive feeling when they see you or are they grimacing or are they squinching their eyes or making faces? Um, also, how they get um, a sense of what your brand is, what people learn about you from others. So a lot of times people will talk to their network and their friends and their contacts and say, hey, what do you know about this woman or man? Uh, give me your feedback so they get additional information. And, you know, they also get an impression of you uh, when they find information about you online. So there's a lot of places that people can get information about you. And so uh, that's how they begin to build their perception of their brand. I really like this definition of what a personal brand is. It's from Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So it almost doesn't matter at all what you think about you, but it really matters what other people think about you. And they may not talk to you about it. It's what they're talking to other people about. And so that's really what your brand is, how other people perceive you. And so it becomes important for you to project information about you well, so people have a very optimistic and positive view of what your brand may be. So why is personal branding so important? Well, for the first thing, it does help you stand out from other people like you. You know, think about what your career is. You are probably not unique in what you do. There are very few people that are very unique in their career. And so when you apply for a position, especially when you apply online, and there can be over 200 people applying for any one position online, your brand will help you stand out from the other 200 people that are applying or the other 199 people that are applying for that position. And also, you need a very strong personal brand if you want to be considered somebody that is very influential. And a lot of times, especially as you get uh, up in your career, maybe you know, from worker more to middle manager to higher manager, you need to be considered an influential person. 
And you need to be someone that can maybe lead projects or teams or efforts within an organization. And so your brand is really what will help define you and demonstrate you as a very influential person. So that becomes important in your career as well. It also creates anticipation. Uh, especially by the other person. Wow, I just can't wait to meet him when she when he comes into the office. So there's a reputation that precedes you. There's something about you uh, that's known. There's an anticipation, and that person has that positive feeling of looking forward to speaking with you or calling you or, or meeting you. Uh, and so your personal brand helps create that sense of anticipation. It also validates you when you refer. Now, we've all heard leverage our network for referrals, and it's very powerful to do so. Our network can be a very powerful tool for us. But just because someone says, hey, you got to go meet this person because I heard she's really good. Typically, when you get a referral, you're going to check that person out, whether it's in the job market or if someone said, hey, you I recommend Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber can fix your problem. You may go online, look for Joe the Plumber's website. So you're going to validate uh, that person or someone's going to validate you when you're referred. So your branding helps demonstrate that as well. Are you someone who's known for doing the things that they want to talk to you about? And the bottom line, and I've heard this in several places. First, I heard it from Alex. And uh, if you are not known, you are irrelevant. And I don't mean that as an insult but really it's just an observation. If someone is looking for someone like you, if someone wants to find out more about you and they can't, functionally you're irrelevant. They can't validate, they can't create an understanding of who you are. So you may not be found or you may not be able to be validated. So you, you wanna be able to begin to promote your brand, your value to others. And there are lots of ways you're going to be able to do that. We're going to touch on some of those ways. We're not going to deep dive into them. That's not the intent of this program, but really introduce you to some topics and why it's important for you to dig further. So let's talk about ways to build your personal brand. Now, first of all, you do have to have some self-reflection. You need to be able to look at yourself uh, as objectively as possible. And typically, we don't do this very well. And, uh, you know, sometimes we look at ourselves in the mirror and we just look at that one pimple that we have on our cheek or the wrinkle that's forming on our forehead or whatever it is. We tend to be very critical of ourselves. And it's okay to have a little bit of critiquing and, and a, a criti critical view a little bit is how well am I doing, but you can't be completely, uh, um, you have to be completely as completely objective as possible and not completely negative. <laughs> You also need to know who your audience is, who it is you need to reach, who, do, who it is you need to promote your personal brand to. And your audience is, the, you know, the people you're selling yourself to. You need to understand the language that they understand. So use that language. If they're business people, use business language. If they're not business people, don't use business language. You also need to understand, are you reaching out to individuals or are you reaching out to influencers? Individuals don't really have a strong network and you're looking to connect with them one-on-one, -on -one, but influencers are people that have an established network and you can leverage the use of their network by reaching out to that influencer as well. You really strongly can promote your brand more effectively through influencers, people that also have a network and their network may begin to learn about you. And your personal branding message and your professional branding message, it needs to be consistent among all the platforms you use. So if you're on different social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and have a website and on LinkedIn, don't mix the messages because it's possible that the people that are learning about you will find you in different places. And if there's a mixed message, it's going to be confusing. If you're looking to have a Facebook page that's purely personal and have a different sense of branding or information that's important to you as compared to LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or other sites, you may want to secure your Facebook uh, very well so people can't easily find a lot of information. Uh, so that way it doesn't uh, mix up the influence. 
And you need to understand what's important to your audience and you need to understand how to communicate to your audience. You need to understand how the audience, what social media platforms they use, the things that they follow, the things that are important to them because your professional audience are gonna be able to uh, better understand you when you communicate in a way that's clear for them. This is really a selfish process. You may have a message that you want to get across. You may think that you have a way to get it across to others. But if it's not the way other people are listening, they may just turn tune you out. So it's a selfish process, and they are the selfish people. You need to get the message across in a way that they will listen and want to learn more. So you need to understand how your audience communicates and communicates with them in that way. It could be the language you use, the platforms you use, the places you go online, the places you go on person, uh, the clubs that you join, whatever that is, you need to be aligned with your audience. So who is your audience? Well, for each of you, you have to figure that out. I can't tell you uh, for all of you on the call right now, who your individual audience is, you need to figure that out. But let's see if we can do that. It's basically those that you want to reach and be seen by. That's who your audience is. Your audience, the people you want to reach, the people that you want to see you, may be different than my audience. So I really can't tell you yourself who your audience is. Depending on what you do professionally, maybe your audience are typically lay people. Maybe you're a business to consumer type person and you need to reach out to consumers, lay people who don't know business terms and acronyms and industry terms. If that's who your audience is, then the way you communicate, the way you post, the way you uh, write online, the sites that you go visit need to be the sites that that audience will go to. Don't use lots of acronyms if your audience won't really understand them. If your audience tends to be in your profession, if they tend to be industry people, professionals in your industry, then you certainly can use industry terms and technical terms and acronyms, and then that would be fine. In fact, if you decide to use lay people terms, less technical terms, and your audience are technical people, um, you may turn them off. They may say, you don't understand what you're talking about. I know for myself in my IT consulting business, my clients tend not to be very technical. So in my blog posts and my communications, I use lay people terms. Now, when I do have to talk to my professional network, I don't do that. But when I'm trying to sell to my clients, that's my primary audience to grow my business, I tend to use more of the lay person terms. And it just makes it easier for them to understand. Or I use more analogies and just make it easier for them. And so you have to be sensitive to that as well. So, um, I haven't heard Bill interrupt, but uh, remember, anybody who has a question about any of this, uh, please use chat. Post the word question in chat. Bill's keeping his eyes on the chat, and we can have questions and answers during the program. So feel free if you do have a question now. David, so far, everything's quiet. Okay. So very good. So we will continue to move forward. So certainly as you promote your brand, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, promoting your brand has tremendous value throughout your job search. We'll talk a little bit really today about the context of uh, getting you to the offer. So you want to have a branding statement. You want to have something that really defines and states just what it is you're trying to get out. What message you want to leave people with. So you have to craft a, a branding statement and practice it so that you can talk about it. You don't have to just write it. So you want to craft a branding statement and you want to practice it. For some of you, it's very similar to an elevator pitch. For others, it's more like a value proposition, which can be an elevator pitch, but is more specific. And I know Alex talks quite a bit about value proposition. Again, we're not going into great detail about crafting these things. It'll just be too much of a presentation. But certainly understand that you need to have that branding statement. And remember, it's got to be consistently used across all platforms. Find multiple platforms. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be on every platform right now. For a lot of us, whether it's using um, social media, platforms, using your website, using LinkedIn and others, um, it's a little overwhelming. There are too many places, especially when you're getting started. 
So you may want to just start with one, or if you're on one, add one more. But ultimately, you want to be on the multiple platforms where your audience is likely to be. And have that consistent message, both online and in written documents, like your resume and your marketing documents and everything else. You don't want people to kind of scratch their head and try and figure out what is it that this person is trying to, to sell me? What is it this person is trying to demonstrate he or she is as an expert? If it's a mixed message, you'll probably get these people turned off and they'll move on to other candidates. Hey, David. Yeah. We have a question from Greg. And I'll, I'll read it out now. Okay. It didn't come through, Bill. Not sure if you zoned out. Bill, are you there or am I there? Hmm. You're, You're there, there Dave. Okay, I'm there. Okay, so let's see. I can go look for the question from Greg. Yeah, I, I'm back, I think. Oh, okay. There you go. Good. Um, technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> all right, here, here's the question. I understand the need for consistency. Should you keep it general to cover multiple positions, or do you jigger it to be specific to a position? My my thought is that it, it, it can be general. It doesn't need to be for a specific position as much as uh, the role or the industry that you are involved in. So you, you can zoom out a little bit from the very specific position as long as you can demonstrate expertise as part of your brand, demonstrate expertise in your industry or in the type of role that you're going to be in. So I think you can zoom out a little. It does become difficult if you're trying to create a brand for different industries, different roles, different types of jobs. And as an example, you might say, I'm a project manager in the logistics industry and I'm a dog walker. And so that, that creates a little bit more of a challenge. Not that it's impossible to do, but that becomes a little bit more of a challenge. So focus more on uh, almost like your resume, the kind of industry that you're trying to get into. And it looks like there's also a question from Mandy because she just put a Q, not a word question. So please type the word question. It helps stand out from other comments. How to make your, how to make your, the personal brand unique, more focus on soft skills or hard skills. Um, so, um, you need to focus on both soft and hard skills, and we are actually going to talk about both hard and soft skills in just a moment. So let's hold off that question until then. So I'm not putting you off, Mandy, just saying we'll come back to it in just a moment. Okay. Think we're good, Bill? Yes. Okay. So uh, we talked about um, having the... Sorry, David, we just got another question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, okay, it's a comment by Amit, and he got his answer. So uh, back to you. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm glad I was able to uh, advance answer the question. So glad that worked out for Amit. Okay. Also, you do need to build your professional network. And LinkedIn is a great tool for doing that. I believe we all know that. Uh, lots of I'm sure you've seen lots of presentations on LinkedIn. I've done them, Alex, and other people do presentations on LinkedIn. It's probably your most valuable tool for developing a professional network. But there are other ways you can build a professional network as well. Go on meetup.com. Meetup.com is the world's largest dating website. Actually, that's not what it is at all. What meetup.com, it's kind of like LinkedIn groups on steroids. It really uh, is a platform for actively promoting in-person and virtual groups and in all sorts of categories and functional areas their personal groups and business groups all sorts of groups so you may look at joining meetup.com building a professional profile because what meetup.com the program will do is it'll compare your profile to groups in the in your geographic area and send you an email let you know there are groups that are meeting 
Find professional associations, chambers of commerce, other business groups, church groups, volunteer organizations, other places where you can meet people. Even if they're not in your profession, they may be connected to people that can help you. So in addition to using LinkedIn, find these other places and opportunities where you can meet and get connected to other people. Again, they don't all have to be in your profession. They could be other people, you know, lay people outside your profession who they themselves have a network of people and some may be in your profession or industry of interest. And we talked about creating that value proposition or that uh, branding statement. You want to have relatable stories. You want to have your accomplishments ready as relatable stories, not just tasks. You know, just don't tell them, I know Excel and I know point of sale systems and, and I know project management, but you'd want to be able to tell stories that demonstrate your expertise. And so there are several acronyms that are out there. One is called SAR, Situation Action Result. Others that are out there, STAR, S-T-A-R, Situation Task Action Result. PAR, Problem Action Result, CAR, Challenge Action Result. Uh, I know Marty Latman likes to say PAR-V, Problem Action Result Value. So there's different acronyms that are out there that basically all represent the same thing. The bottom line is you want to be able to talk about uh, your professional experiences and your accomplishments as relatable stories, not just bullet points as tasks. And so we'll talk a little bit more about the situation action result, that version of the acronym. And, you know, it's really a technique used to express all the important information about any of the skills that you have and also the resulting accomplishment. You just don't state that you know something, but just tell how you used it and how you used it well. And basically what the situation does, it really kind of sets the scene, sets up the story. It's the, you know, the first chapter of the book, that kind of thing. And by all means, you should not have a 300 page book that, that you're reading out loud as a SAR. But that's what the situation is. Uh, it discusses the challenge or the problem that was facing you. The action talks about what you did in order to create an accomplishment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the end result is the outcome. So you set the scene, you explain what you did, and then you tell us what the outcome or the result is. And that's the goal of creating a situation, an action, a result, a SAR, or a car or a part. And I'll give you an example of one right now. So here's a bullet point, and this may be very valid. I am proficient in ex expediting the month end close process. So if you're in a financial department, uh, financial planning and analysis, accounting in an organization, uh, you may be responsible for closing out the, the month end, uh, the books of the month, you know, your income statement, your, your uh, other statements that have become important. And uh, most companies do that. In uh, a former company, I worked in the IT department supporting the uh, uh, financial services department. So I was very attuned to this process from an IT perspective. And yes, this could be true. I am proficient in expediting the month and close process. But it really doesn't tell the depth of your expertise and why and how you're proficient. So if we do it as a SAR, we might say challenge with a long month end closing process. So there's the situation, there's the problem, the challenge that you are facing. So challenge with a long month end closing process, I reorganize my team's end of month work time into two shifts. And this is the action that you took. You're explaining what you did. So you might have a small team, four, five, six people, whatever that is. And instead of them all working nine to five or 8.30 to five, you broke them into two shifts. By doing so, I put more staff hours into this process, reducing the organization's end of month close time by two days. So you're demonstrating a little bit of creativity by now breaking your team into two teams for a few days. You now have more contiguous hours towards the end of the month, actually the start of the next month, allowed you to close out the books two days sooner. This kind of statement this SAR is much more effective in, in expressing your expertise and promoting your value in your brand than just bullet points. So as much as possible, use SARS. <clears throat> so to Mandy's questions, you also want to promote your skills. So there are two types of skills. There are hard skills and there are soft skills. 
So we'll talk about the hard skills first. Hard skills are those that are really your technical knowledge, the things you were trained on, the skills that you gain through your professional experience, through your education. So these are the tools that you use. Those are the hard skills. Maybe you worked in the retail industry. You may know how to use a point of sale system, and that would be a hard skill that you know how to use it. You can talk about how you use it efficiently or effectively. Maybe you've worked as an accountant or in financial planning or other departments where you needed to crunch numbers. You may know how to use Excel very well. Excel, knowing how to use Excel is a hard skill. You may have studied a foreign language and you may be able to speak it fluently. Having that as a skill, that's a hard skill, something that you've learned along the way, something that you can use and leverage in your, in your professional life. And you may be able to work in an organization that requires someone to be multilingual. Hey, David. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Greg, um, and here goes. If it's a team result, should you say that it should you say that versus a personal result, or should you try to find the personal ones? So I think both become important. Uh, most of us do not work by ourselves. So in your next opportunity, your next position, you may be working in a team environment. And so you may be able to promote what you've done in a team environment, how you've worked with others, either as a participant on the team or as a leader on the team. Certainly talk about those. And the personal ones that you've done by yourself or maybe by yourself on the team, um, you could talk about those as well. So I, I think both become important. Yep, thanks, Greg. Anything else? Not right now. Very good. Okay, so let us move to soft skills. So soft skills, a little different than hard skills, these are not those technical skills. These are the skills that relate how you do your work and how you work well, not just for the, the tools that you use. So your soft skills tend to be the relate to how you work not the specific tools that you use. So it's a little bit different and that becomes important to understand. These are often skills that are not taught in the classroom. And sadly, sometimes they're not even measured or recorded. That becomes very disappointing when our you know, supervisors don't recognize our soft skills, but it becomes important for us to promote them because having good soft skills can separate us from some of the other uh, uh, candidates that people are looking for. It does help you become more successful in the workplace by being able to relate to how well you do your work, not just the skills that you have, the hard skills that you have, can make you more effective in the workplace. So you may focus on things like, how have you proved yourself to be a team player? That may go a little bit in line with Greg's question a little bit earlier. Um, and maybe how you resolve conflict with coworkers. Right? You didn't use Excel to do that. You didn't use the point of sale system. There may be techniques that you have, people skills that you have. How have you adapted to unexpected challenges? And that becomes important. How do you communicate with others when those unexpected challenges come up? So that can be an example of soft skills. So a little bit different than the hard skills. And these are extremely valuable in the workplace and extremely valuable for your brand, especially as in a moment when you get into negotiation. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. So <clears throat> I believe that there's a tremendous value in promoting your soft skills in addition to your hard skills. I think you really need to look behind your hard skills. And the reason why is when you only look at your hard skills, some hard skills become outdated. Um, you know, if you are only using an old version of a spreadsheet, maybe you're expert in Lotus 1, 2, 3 or VisiCalc programs that really aren't used any longer, and you're trying to sell yourself into an Excel position, that's outdated. So that's not gonna sell you into the position. So some of your hard skills actually can be a little insufficient when it comes to uh, promoting yourself and negotiating. Also, soft skills can more easily be transferred from one job to another. Some of the soft skills that you have are easily transferable. They don't go out of date, <clears throat> excuse me, where hard skills can become a little outdated. I noticed, and I recall when I was job hunting, a number of years ago, and I haven't done uh, corporate job hunting for a few years, 
Um, the company that I left, they, you know, they were fine. They were a fine company, but they were using older tools. They were comfortable with them. They didn't want to invest in new tools. But a lot of companies that I was interviewing with went with newer technology. So my hard skills were outdated. But the way I accomplish, the way I learn, the way I grow, those things, those are easily transferable. Also, the transferable skills help position your future value because you base it on prior experiences. And so it can be used for when you apply for any new job. You can take your transferable skills because they are transferable, uh, soft skills, and apply them to new jobs. The way you approached working before is the way you're going to approach working going forward. It becomes extremely important when you're looking for jobs in different industries because some industries, some hiring managers do have a hard time understanding the value of a potential employee who has come from a different industry. You may have not, you may not have the exact hard skills they're looking for, but you may have the soft skills that they're looking for. Promote those. Certainly the same can be said if you're changing your role or position. If you're looking to move up or down or across the, of the ladder in terms of a role, you're going to talk about your soft skills because some of the hard skills may not be appropriate for the new role or new position. And again, with jobs where uh, skills are becoming outdated or where you have um, skills that are outdated because the company has moved forward, <clears throat> the new company has moved forward with new hard skills, new tools. So yes, um, soft skills become something that's much more important to promote. David? Yep. We have a quick request about uh, the availability of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> this slide deck will be on the website. Actually, I posted it there first thing this morning. And this presentation video will be available on the website and our YouTube channel uh, by this afternoon or this evening. Thank you. Yep. yep, you're welcome. So yeah, I'm very appreciative for all of our presenters who have been able to provide uh, their documentation and allowing us to video the programs when they're able to. So, and of course I do that as well. Okay. And so here's kind of a simple list of some hard skills and some soft skills. These tend to be, at least the hard skills, a bit more technical oriented. So some of these may not be appropriate or specific to all of you, and that's okay. But the soft skills are kind of universal. So kind of get an idea. This is not the be all end all list of soft skills, but to try and give you an idea of the contrast between soft skills and hard skills. And, um, you know, you can also get this list, you can search on your own, or you can get this list from the presentation a little later, because the presentation will be on our website. But um, when I do a presentation on soft and hard skills, people always ask, can I give examples? So here's a quick page that shows some examples. You may have to find the hard skills and the soft skills that are right for you. <clears throat> So let's talk about salary negotiation. There are different points where you have to talk about salary, but notice there's a difference between discuss your salary and negotiate your salary. Those are two different things. They're two different timings of when you discuss salary and negotiate. And by the way, we are not talking about historical salary. What did you used to make? And just to let you know in New Jersey, it's actually now considered illegal and inappropriate for a hiring company to ask your historical salary during the interview process. Um, not all hiring managers or companies may know that. You may still get the question, what did you used to make? You'll have to decide if you do or don't want to answer the question. Um, but they are allowed to ask you, what did you used to make when they give you the offer? Because now it's not part of the decision process. It's more of their validation process. But that's historical salary. Here we're talking about discussing your anticipated salary at your next employer. So you may get on the job application, what are you looking to make? And a lot of people are concerned about putting that number down because they feel that it locks them in. Some people say they'll put zero. Do not put zero for a couple of reasons. One is if the applicant tracking system is, has a range or if the person has a range in mind and you put zero, you're clearly outside the range, you'll be excluded from consideration. 
So you have to put really, in my opinion, if it's a single number, I would call it your minimum acceptable salary. And I'll just create a, a, an example. It may not be 100% accurate. Let's say you're a project manager, and you know project managers typically earn seventy-five dollars to $85,000 a year at your level. And you know the minimum salary you're willing to accept or the minimum salary you need is $75,000. That's what you put on the application. Don't mull it over. Don't think about should you put more or less. There's no way to know what the right answer that the hiring manager or the applicant tracking system is looking for. So you don't want to price yourself out of the market by being too high, your minimum acceptable salary. This is not what your salary offer is going to be, and you are not negotiating right now. You're just putting it down on the application because it's required. If you leave that answer out, you're hiding something. That's the perception you don't want to do that. What about when you get that screening interview from usually HR? They may ask you, what salary are you expecting? So fortunately, you're not writing anything down. You're just discussing it with an HR generalist. Um, I'd say give a salary range, a realistic salary range. And notice a little asterisks there. You only discuss it if you're asked. No need to discuss it if you're not. So that's when you may say, I'm looking for seventy-five dollars to $85,000. Now, you really don't know a whole lot about the job other than what's in the job description. And you may not even know if $85,000 is even high enough, but put that realistic range. This is not set in stone. This is the move you through the process. And then you may have an interview with the hiring manager. <clears throat> the hiring manager may ask, if they didn't read the HR person's notes, uh, what salary are you looking for? And I'd say perfectly fine to give the same answer. I'm looking for seventy-five to uh, $85,000. You may even have other interviews further down the line, maybe division managers, the hiring manager's boss or others in the organization. And if they ask, same thing, I would give that realistic salary range. Don't change the number. If you had a discussion with the hiring manager and you now realize that there's a lot to this job, it's gonna be very resource intensive, it really deserves not 75 to 85, but maybe 90,000, don't change it to, with the division manager because now the hiring manager and the division manager, they're gonna talk about you and you don't want them to have anything that's out of sync in any of your answers. You're not negotiating. You haven't negotiated yet. You're only discussing. You'll get an offer. When you get an offer for that position, now is your opportunity to negotiate. Look at the heading on the top. The underscore went from discuss underscore now to negotiate. Now we're negotiating. It's expected, it's, or at the very least, it's not unexpected that you may negotiate for salary. We're gonna talk more about salary negotiation in just a moment. So you have an opportunity. So even if you gave them the range of 75 to 85,000, but you know the salary based on all your interviews should be higher, you have an opportunity at this point to begin to make a case for that. This is the opportunity to do so. Once you accept the offer and start working, it's just too late. You just are not going to be able to negotiate until when you get close to annual review time. And you should not wait until a week or two before they're going to pay out your, your um, new salary next year. You have to make a case for this early on, probably two, three months before um, they start doing salary uh, assignments. So you can negotiate during the, the offer, and then, but not after. You have to wait until your next yearly review. So that's the difference between just discussing your salary and when it's appropriate to negotiate your salary. Before you negotiate, you got that offer, before you negotiate, know that salary is not the only negotiable item. There are other types of compensation. So be aware of what they may be. Or work-life balance. You may be able to negotiate flexible hours. Um, you may need to start early and be home early or start late and work late, maybe because of family obligations. Maybe you want work from home days. That may be negotiable. There may be other types of cash that you can get paid. You might have a sign-on bonus or an end-of-year bonus. Overtime may be paid. You can have reimbursed expenses. So you want to make sure that that uh, does that as well, that you're aware of that as well. Understand what non-cash benefits are, are available. What are their medical plan or medical plans? Do they have more than one? Dental plan. 
Do they have gym memberships or club memberships that they can offer? Make sure you understand. Tuition reimbursement they may have. Do they give stock options? Anything that may be uh, of value to you? Because um, these may be things that you can negotiate even if you can't negotiate salary. Also look at their retirement plans. Lots of companies have the 401 type plans. See what types of investments. Is it a plan that has maybe five different investments or 50 different investments? That may be important to you because one with more investments may be more conducive for you to grow your retirement if you know how to invest properly. Look at the company's match rate. Are they matching 50 cents on the dollar for the first 6% of income that you contribute? Are they matching 75 cents to the dollar? Are they matching dollar for dollar? What is your eligibility? Do you need to be there at least a year in the company or you can you start contributing right away? Because if you could start contributing and getting matches right away, that's free money now rather than waiting a period of time. Um, personal time off. Companies offer typically different types of personal time off. They can be vacations, personal days, holidays. How many do they give? Um, some companies may say in your first few years, you start with two weeks and then we add on after that. Some add vacation times based on your level in your employee, in, in your employer. Um, holidays, some companies uh, work on national holidays. Uh, I used to work at a medical practice. We worked on most paid holidays because that's when the patients can come to the office. Uh, but we were given comp time for those. So look at all those, understand what's there. And if you need resources to also help you find out what realistic salary ranges may be, here are some different websites that you can go to. Now, when you download the slides a little later, these are all active hot links. So you can just click on them. You don't have to worry about mistyping them at all. So, hey, David, you want... yep. We have a question from Amit. Yep. Uh, do we know the companies that ask for salary expectations on their career portals Always use the ATS, ATS to filter based on the answer. Um, so the, the short answer is we don't know at all how any company uses their ATS because they use it the way they want to. So I cannot tell you, I know companies do or don't use it. So my feeling is you have to assume if they're asking you some sort of question like a screening screening question, what is your salary expectation, as an example, that they are likely using it as a means to screen you in or screen you out. And so you have to assume that they are using it that way, but there's no way to know, Yeah, unfortunately. Thanks, David. And also John Sampson would like to make a comment. Oh, sure. Hi, John. You have to unmute yourself, John. A couple of other lots of uh, things that you might think about when you're in this negotiation business. Uh, one has to do with what they've said to you about what you'll do. Uh, there's one person on our landed list who was able to negotiate out four or five things he didn't want to do. They said, fine, we're not talking money now, so this could uh, be something you're negotiating with your manager directly. But another thing that you definitely want to start thinking about is, I hope after this experience of being out of work for a while uh, has made you a believer about networking. So one of the things you want to definitely negotiate about is the industry slash uh, vendor uh, conferences. You want to go to those because they're wonderful networking events. Yeah, terrific observations in addition. So thanks so much. Absolutely understand what the uh, requirements of the job are. And I think I've got a bullet point on that in the next slide. And also, yeah, in addition to no, um, you know, work-life balance or other cash, that there are conferences that you want. Or you want um, one that I, I negotiated when my job function changed in the company is I wanted coverage payment for uh, reaching a certification. And so they, my company agreed to do that as well. So yeah, there are lots of things to, to use, but in this slides, I uh, wanted to give some good examples, but thanks, John. Okay, anything else, Bill? Um, Joe Levinson just uh, uh, adds uh, that a parking spot, if, it, <laughs> if you're in a major city, might be a uh, benefit that most people will not ask for. 
you know, I guess if you're going to work in a big city like Philadelphia, New York, that doesn't have a lot of easy parking, you know, um, you know, New York, I remember I haven't been in parking very often in New York, but I remember seeing it some of the parking lots, four or $500 a month for parking. Yeah, they'll cover that. That's terrific. Yeah. yeah. And even close to home, um, there's an organization that I've dealt with in Trenton that um, as just as an occasional visitor, uh, they have to make special arrangements for me to park in their lot. Okay. The employees have their spots. Okay, sure. Right. So maybe that's available. Um, I know I had worked years ago at a Wall Street company. And if I worked after six o'clock, they ordered dinner so I can go to the local deli or whatever. And if I worked past uh, nine o'clock, they gave me a car service to come home. So I didn't have to get to the subway to the railroad and all that, I got a car service. So if I knew I was working until 7.30 or eight, I stayed till nine and took the car service home. So yeah, there's lots of things. You have to understand all the benefits, certainly they're available. Uh, David, I want to make a comment about these four slides. Can you bring it back for one second? There is a big difference here. For example, salary.com and Glassdoor, they are free. I don't want to say they're worthless, but if they say, well, your job has been seventy-five to $138,000, that's not very helpful to you. However, if you are going to payscale.com, that is a service for fee. Uh, many years ago, when I checked them out, it was $260. But for that, you really get an entire brochure about your position, your your uh, duties, I mean, they match it. And the most important part is, it is geographically adjusted. I always say a plumber in New York City makes probably double than a plumber in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Why? They do the same thing because it is geographically adjusted. Sure. sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, so yeah. great tips, Alex. Yeah. Make sure that you do understand uh, as, as, honed as possible what a realistic salary and i've given you different resources and bureau of labor statistics it's the government aggregation i believe they do regional um breakdowns as well um, they'll also talk about trends in industries different types of positions so bureau of labor statistics has a tremendous amount of resources and, and information yeah thanks alex yeah one quick comment that i would have um like joe mentioned about the parking spot um, I had worked for a very large company in Jersey City, and right behind the building, they had a parking garage, um, which, as David had mentioned, you know, the rates can be as high as like $400 or so a month. Um, my company gave us stipends where it would, it cost us only $50 a month. So that was a great benefit for us you know anyone commuting sure i had interviewed with a company a number of years ago in northern manhattan they were north of the george washington bridge and they had they were a, um, a healthcare facility they had an employee parking lot of course you had to commute into manhattan by car but that's how they made it easier for some of their employees that they had that available to them so yeah, there's lots of benefits that can be available. The idea behind this slide is there are things other than cash that may be benefits that the company offers that may be uh, beneficial and that may be negotiable. Be aware of them before you negotiate. David, the other thing that you, even if they, you, even if you don't want to negotiate extra, if you're taking any kind of mass transit or, or, or paying tolls and stuff, I believe there's something called transit pass or something of that sort. The company I worked for had just started offering it in time for the pandemic where we didn't use it, where basically you get money, you can take money out of your paycheck tax free to buy your your tickets or pay for your parking lot and that kind of. Yep, I've heard, yep, I've heard of those before. Um, again, know that 
there are lots of different benefits that different companies may offer. Uh, you'll need to investigate that. We're going to talk in a moment a way you can find those out. But yeah, but if there's a, a offset of commuting costs, that may be available as well. So terrific. And so as you negotiate the offer, so of course, congratulations for getting the offer. You have to evaluate what's important to you and you also have to consider what's important to the other party, why they want you. And it's important to understand both sides of this negotiating. It makes you, it allow you to be more effective because you don't negotiate to win. I, in my opinion is it's false to negotiate to win. Negotiate to get everything that you want at the expense of what the other people feel is important. What I believe you need to do is you need to negotiate to win-win. You only negotiate to win when it all goes your way, when you don't ever expect to deal with the other party again. I'll give an example of where it's okay to negotiate to win. Maybe you have a used car. You're going to buy a new car, uh, but you're going to go sell your, your former car uh, on the open market. The dealer just isn't going to give you enough. And so you say, well, my 10 year old car is worth $2,500. You can be firm on that. And if someone then offers you something less, you could say, no, nope, I'm gonna be firm. It's $2,500 and the car is as is. If they're not happy, they can walk. What difference does it make? You're never gonna do business with that car buyer again. You can afford to hold out if you want to. But when dealing with your employer, your future employer, there are things that they're willing to, to give and there are things that they're not. Don't hold out, negotiate to win-win. So your goal really should be, you have to find a, a mutually acceptable compromise that gives you as much as you can get and to allow them to give as much as they're able or willing to give up. And that will make for a very friendly relationship. Remember, you've got to work with these people for eight hours a day, hopefully for a long time. You don't want to get off at the beginning and have them be mad at you, but they do expect you to negotiate. Just don't be that hard line negotiator only to win. Now, uh, also speak with HR and benefits. This is before uh, the, the offer starts or as you begin to negotiate the offer. And the reason why is you're gonna find out what the benefits are that your company, your future company does offer. Do they give you opportunity for parking? Do they give you uh, opportunity to have a transit pass? Uh, when, when does, uh, matching 401 start, all those things. And also take into, take into consideration other things. You know, what's the company culture going to be like? What is it going to be like for you to work there? What's your commute going to be like if they do require you to be in the office, even if they require you to be in one day a week or five days a week? There are lots of things that you need to take into consideration that become important to you as you prepare to negotiate the offer. Okay. Make sure you understand the role and your value in the role. Make sure you understand what they want you to do, because that becomes very important for you to negotiate the offer. Uh, remember that project manager position. You think it's it might be seventy five to eighty five thousand dollars, but um, there may be things that they want you to do in the role that really mean it's a little bit more, and that may be justified. So make sure you understand all that. And so you'll start from a place from agreement, which is based on the offer. You'll, you'll talk about in negotiating the things that you're appreciating. I appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the ability to work on your team. I like the project that you're working. You know, make sure there are things that you really understand when you negotiate with someone that really is, is really good for you and hopefully good for them as well. And then what you do is you ask for what you want and what you need. This is not being greedy. This is, this is business. Remember the Godfather movie, it's just business. And you'll politely, professionally state your reasons, why you feel you deserve these things in your offer. And you're gonna support your reasons with the value you're bringing, the things that are important to them. Really, it's your brand, the, the things that they think about you when you're not in the room. These are the reasons that will allow them to be willing to give some of the additional items that they may be able to do. So you'll want to support your reasons, your needs with the value that you bring to the organization. And then ultimately expect a counteroffer. And it may not be everything that you're asking for. 
And it also may not be the case that you're going to go back and forth three, four, five, six times. So you have to do this kind of in a thorough process. Um, so make sure that you, but you will get a counter offer and hopefully that will be one that will be comfortable for you. So as we wrap up, remember that your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And again, that's Jeff Bezos' description, but I, I like this one. I think that's a good summary discussion of just what your brand is. It's how people perceive you, not just what how you perceive yourself. Your personal brand does help you stand out from other people who are like you, especially in job hunt and also as you get close to negotiation. And your branding message needs to be unified across all of the different places you promote it. That becomes very important. Don't have a mixed message. Develop those SAR stories that you can use to promote your brand and your value. And you can revisit them not just in the interview process, but when you're negotiating your offer as well. And negotiate very well informed. So make sure you have all the information you have, both about what the job will be required, what they require of you, and what all the opportunities for, for compensation are. Be very well informed. And then professionally negotiate to win-win. It's going to be mutually beneficial and mutually uh, satisfying to both. And that becomes very important. Um, oh, so here is our slide deck where it will be. This is where all our slide decks are. In case you didn't know, on our website, we have a link called Meeting Presentation Documents. It's really on all the pages. And when you click on that link, then the page will change and you'll get links to all of our meetings, not just for this year, but almost all of them since 2013. But uh, since last March, almost all of our presenters have allowed us to have video as well. So you can kind of see a little below that meeting presentation documents. Subscribe and view our YouTube channel. That's where the videos are all located, the presentation videos. Um, any more questions? Uh, Dave, yeah, just- Not on uh, the chat, David. Right. Okay, thank you, Bill. Yeah, John? Um, as you're doing this negotiation, at the end, uh, you want to do as much as you can to codify it some way. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind is with the current employment market out there, the person you're negotiating with and or your manager uh, may well be uh, looking for, for a job themselves and or there are internal changes. So, for instance, when you talk about, I want to go to the... Um, Oracle users group every year, that's a, that should be put down in writing someplace so that later on you really have some standing about, wait a minute, you told me I was gonna go, gonna go do this. Um, uh, so many things that I hear about that people want don't actually occur because Larry got promoted, we got bought, all that kind of stuff. Well, certainly the office is a fluid environment. So if Larry gets promoted in you know, six months from now, and it may impact your work life, um, that's possible. But the bottom line, I do agree, anything that you're negotiating should be in the written offer. So they may have their policy and their employee handbook that talks about things that are not very flexible. For instance, if they require that only employees one year or longer are going to be eligible for the retirement plan, the 401, you may not be able to negotiate anything right. different. But of course, if they say, um, yeah, we can give you one extra week vacation to get started, um, so you don't have to wait three years to earn that extra vacation. Um, yeah, get that in writing. Make sure it's there so that there's no misunderstanding. Yeah, it's got to be clear. If it's not in writing, it's going to be a he said, she said, and you may yes. be unhappy later on. So yeah, yep. good observation, John. Thank you. Uh, David, may I make a few comments? Absolutely. Okay, good. First, at the beginning of the meeting, someone asked the question, uh, if I can paraphrase, how do you adjust your personal branding to the position? And my answer is you don't. Uh, your personal brand is not like an application that you adjust based on the job uh, 
uh, re requirement. The brand is something you build for years and years and years, and uh, it takes a very long time to build it. It can very quickly disappear or be ruined just by one comment or something negative. So be very careful. So that's about that. You don't adjust your brand. The other thing I wanted to mention, kind of supplementing a little bit about what you talked about, the personal branding. The question is, how do you create a personal brand? You need to be able to answer to three questions. The fir first question is, who are you? And that's a little bit like the value proposition, but it is different. So the first question is, who are you? And here is what my example is. I'm a career coach specializing in interview preparation. I'm known as a landing expert. Very brief, and based on these two sentences, you get the gist who I am as a person slash as a professional. The next question, and that's the same question that you use in the value proposition. What do you do? Uh, here is my example. I help people in transition and those who contemplate a change. Very quickly, in one, two sentences, I tell people what I do. Again, it has to be very succinct and to the point. And here comes the third question, and that's probably the most difficult one. Why does it matter? Because if you create your personal brand and people say, okay, so what? Then everything you build goes down the toilet. So you need to be able to answer, why does it matter? Here is my answer. While, inter while interviewing, my clients feel prepared and relaxed. Now, the question is, how do you use? Once you created a value, uh, uh, forgive me. Once you created uh, personal branding, the question is, how do you use it? Well, you can use it in multiple outlets. First of all, definitely on LinkedIn, a part of your about section could include that. You can use it when you network with people. You don't have to say to give the answer to the three questions, but as appropriate, this is how you answer. It could be a part of your uh, uh, cover letter, absolutely. There are many, many outlets where you can use it, but you need to know it, you need to have it, you need to have it done and prepared, and as appropriate, you can sprinkle it here and there and everywhere. Alex, thank you very much. I was taking my own notes, and if you don't mind, I'm going to make a slide for that, with those very three questions and add it to this presentation for the next time that I use it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can agree on 10% from the revenue on that, David. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, there's no problem. Uh, ten, yeah. um, and by the way, here's just the PSG of Mercer County contact information. Um, any other questions, thoughts before we move on and wrap up the meeting? Uh, just an observation from, from my point. Um, when you're in negotiations and you have let's say five things that you want, I think you should also be looking at what are the minimum that you would accept because you may not get all five. You may get three. Sure. So you can rank them, absolutely. Yeah, good, nice observation. Thanks. David, I can contribute a little bit of my experience observation on that. And um, one thing I definitely know, Phil, what you said is starting from agreement. And uh, that's really the sales process. And I was trained early on in my career as a salesperson. It's really starting with what a great, so the people, your counterpart is willing to listen and you will easier to reach uh, the disagreement parts and negotiate down in somewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think is a, that's a key skill. And then the second thing is, and as from my uh, experience as a hiring manager, and if we have the budget and uh, cannot exceed the budget, we always send the candidate to negotiate with HR. And because HR really 
um, doesn't have much flexibility and they have to go between the agreed budget and range. So we do not want to really break our uh, have any negative and uh, reactions from the candidates in case we hire them. So uh, that's my experience. If someone sent you to negotiate your salary or benefit with HR, that means you hit the ceiling already. It's very yeah. hard to change. I agree, Mandy. That could certainly be that the company does have a budget and the budget typically is the salary itself and anything directly tied to salary. You know, let's say they said, well, you know, your salary is 80,000 and you get a 10% bonus. Well, if you get more money, you get more bonus. They may not want that, but there may be other things that are negotiable. Can you work from home a couple of days a week? It doesn't cost the company anything more. Um, can I have an extra week of vacation? They may be willing to because they know you check your emails every day anyway, you know, so you're not completely out of touch. So there may be other non-cash things that we can negotiate, but you're right, it's important to understand uh, if the company has reached the budget. Remember, it's um, negotiation is to win-win. There are things that they can and can't do. There are things you, you will and won't do. And uh, so, yeah, make sure that's one of the things that you understand is their requirement or limitation. Yeah, good observation. Hi, David. Uh, one thing I would like to add yeah. is um, if possible, if, say negotiating a, a, a contract uh, is maybe um, have someone you trust, a spouse or a good friend or someone look at the contract, I mean, you, or an attorney, but depending on, on the situation. Uh, I was in a situation where I negotiated a, 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 a contract with an employer and we each had different interpretation of of one of the terms in the contract which ended up becoming a point of dispute down the road and it's just better to get those things clarified so um you know we it, it, we were both not attorneys and we were putting something in in writing and um you know then it turns into something where you have a disagreement down the road and it's better you know to try to clarify by those and, and get those out of the way before uh, moving on to that position. So that would just be one uh, potential uh, suggestion. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's very important when you're getting to a contract type of offer, uh, do have a, an attorney look at it. You mentioned you know, a spouse or someone else. Um, I, I would not have just a spouse or a non-attorney look at it because it's two things. One is, you say, well, do the words make sense to me? And the other one says, yeah, the words make sense. If it's just a lay person, they may not understand if the wording was legal or not in the first place, therefore invalidating that term of the contract. So if you're really getting to a point of a contract, um, do have a, an attorney. And let's just kind of summarize. If the attorney is going to charge you $500 to review the contract, I don't know that they that's the right amount. It seems like a lot. But you're now getting into a, you know, hopefully a long-term situation with an employer that's going to pay you tens of thousands of dollars a year or more. Spend the 500 bucks and, and make sure it's right if you are getting into a contract situation. So, yep, I agree. Also, um, to try to stay away from trigger words, like if you're asking for more vacation, what you're really asking for is uh, paid time that you're not working. <laughs> and so they may have, you know, as you say vacation, that triggers a whole sense of, you know, perceptions on the receiver's end. Right. Now we can do extra vacation, but can they do time that you're paid time for not working? <laughs> right. right. Or if all of a sudden you said, well, you gave me an extra vacation, here's the bill so I can go to the Bahamas. Yeah. <laughs> so, man. I guess there are certain things you do have to make sure are very clear in case this gray area, certainly. Um, and, and I remember in corporate, even now that I'm independent, um, I work on vacation. I don't mind doing it. I don't mind, you know, you know, being on a balcony and with my laptop doing a little work instead of just my home office. But yeah, I limit what I do when I'm you know, out, out, of, out of the office. Yeah, but be clear. Yeah, be specific. Well, I was coming at it from a different angle. I was coming at it from, if you ask the employer for more vacation, that puts it in a certain bucket, which they may not have flexibility for. Sure. They may have more flexibility to give you paid time off. Got it, yeah. 
Yep. And sometimes it's a, yeah, you got to be specific and clarify. Yeah, you're right. Yep. Nice observation. On that same note, too, um, you may find in your industry that it's generally standard to give X number of days of vacation. You know, uh, the company may have a standard of, let's say, two weeks to start. But if in your industry it's three or four weeks, mm -hmm. you know, at 20 other companies, then that's something that you can negotiate and that also doesn't change their budget. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and if, if there's something regulatory, they know what it costs them to hire you and the time off that they may be obligated to provide. Um, I was in banking for seven years and banking at the time, I don't know about now, did have um, out of office requirements. The, the thought was, if you're out of the office and you've been embezzling money, you're now not embezzling money because you're out of the office. I don't know what the digital world, how that impacts that ruling, but I remember that from years ago when there was really no internet. But yeah, there may be regulatory requirements. Again, do your homework, make sure you understand um, the needs and the requirements of the other party it really helps with the negotiation. Yeah, I once worked for a banking firm and um, it was highly encouraged to take vacation uh, at least once a year. And I found out later on that it's they want you to do that so that they can go through your records of what you've been doing without your knowledge to make sure that you're not doing something like embezzling money. Right, right. Yeah, I remember what it used to be, if you had two weeks vacation, it was a requirement that you used one consecutive week out of the office. If you had four weeks vacation, you had to have two consecutive weeks out of the office. Yeah, I think maybe that's so they can do that hunting. Yep. Yeah. I, so, on, on I would add on vacation that it's uh, depending on the company, um, you, you might be in a situation where they give you vacation, but they frown upon you actually using it. <laughs> I worked for a company where basically, you know, they, it was, it was almost unheard of that you take all the vacation that you're given because essentially it, uh, it, there was a kind of like an internal pressure between <clears throat> employees and management that you, uh, it's not, you know, you're there to work and yeah. yeah, you got to use some of your vacation, but essentially it was, it was not a situation where it was looked upon favorably to uh, to actually take all of it. Yeah, so if that's the case, what you may want to make sure is that um, you can be paid cash for your unused vacation. I had one boss who actually said, I have to approve your vacation and I can deny it. Yes. Okay. That was one. And he also said, well, I don't use all the four weeks that I'm given. <laughs> so... I left that job too. <laughs> I can tell you in the last company that I was employed by, um, I put in, I'm taking these two weeks off. And the reason why was I had already booked uh, an anniversary vacation for my wife and I, a 25th anniversary, and it was booked. And I wanted them to know that at less than six months of employment, I was taking two weeks off and it was part of the negotiation, the offer. And yeah, they were pissed in the end. and. But it was, you know, we had to honor it. Anyway, folks, let's wrap up for now. And uh, let me stop sharing. I hope I press the right button. Stop screen sharing. There we go. And get to terrific. Well, I appreciate all the activity and uh, input from all of you. That's certainly been very nice to hear. And let's see. Oh, look, there's still people in the meeting. How nice. Thank you. And uh, just as we wrap up, I want to let you know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. We will be right back here next week, July 9th. And our presenter is John Cochran. Cochran. Uh, John will be presenting how to get your friends, family, and contacts to work for you in your job search. So he's going to tell us techniques of how to leverage the people that we know, how to make them more active allies in our job search. So John will be presenting next week, July 9th. The following week, July 16th, <clears throat> um, Michael Goldberg will be back. I'm so excited. I like this presentation. Knockout approaches to virtual networking. Um, 
he has another presentation called Knockout Networking, and he had great tips and ideas for that. This is not Knockout Approaches to Virtual Networking. I think virtual networking is going to be here for the longest time, even though we're kind of coming out of the pandemic right now, so it'll help us be more efficient and effective that way. Um, also next week, July 10th, which is Saturday, July 10th, 8 o'clock in the morning, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting, and Colleen Ferrari will be presenting. She's from Employment Tutors. Get the interview. And that's what she's going to be presenting next Saturday, July 10th, 8 o'clock in the morning. Check out thebreakfastclubnj.com, thebreakfastclubnj.com. Um, Monday uh, is typically, Mondays is PSG of Central New Jersey. They meet at 10.30 a.m., uh, psgcnj.biz. It is possible that they're meeting on Tuesday since Monday is the legal holiday. Um, so you check their website, psgcnj.biz. And each Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning is PSG of Morris County, psgmc.org psgmc.org, and uh, those meetings are also always free. New, Jer New Jersey Job Seekers meets each Tuesday evening at 7.30 in the evening. I did post the link, uh, the Zoom meeting link, in our PSG of Mercer County LinkedIn group. So all that is there for you. So good, folks. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here on our holiday weekend. I hope you have an enjoyable Independence Day weekend. Um, looks like the weekend will clear up in time for Sunday and Monday, so we can still get our barbecues and family time and other things in uh, during the weekend. Hopefully, you'll all have some fun. Uh, but until we get to see each other again, maybe virtually next week, we'll simply say bye, everybody. <laughs>